The 2013 film Her is the best movie ever made. You can argue with me, but you'd be wrong. It also has one of the greatest musical sequences of any non-musical film I've ever seen. When telling a simple character story without much in-your-face visual variety, it's really important to give weight to your soundtrack. Fans of this film are very familiar with the scene on the beach, where Samantha, Theodore's girlfriend, composes a piano piece for him over the phone. The track has no title, in the soundtrack it's labeled Song on the Beach. It's a solo piano piece centered around major seven chords in a simple progression. In almost a waltzy, ambient, relaxed dance, a simple bass punch is followed by treble coloring dancing about. The melody feels grounded, but free. While Theodore sits silently on the beach, listening to these simple, delicate, floating notes, we feel the comfort that our characters are feeling together. But hang on. This is being played by a computer? The fun hook of her is that it's about a relationship between a human and an artificial intelligence. It creates a quirky, odd twist on the romantic genre while taking it super seriously. Samantha is an AI that Theodore falls in love with over the course of the movie. The structure isn't very Hollywood. It doesn't indulge in melodrama, instead sitting in a borderline mumblecore naturalism. As a result, there's a lot of humming and hawing. Mm. I don't know. The camera is pressed right up to Theodore's face to push us into the intimate space that the characters are sharing. The drama of the story doesn't come from forced plot points or cliches, but from how these specific lovebirds work to overcome the challenges of this very specific relationship. It can be tough to find a structure in a love story based on feelings rather than concrete desires or goals, but Spike Jones incorporated Samantha's hobby of making music to lock the script into three distinct acts, each separated by a moment where Samantha shares her music with Theodore. Film is a visual and audio medium. We have to use our tools to their fullest extent. The timbres of your score can tell us as much about the world and characters of your story as literal images do. Listening to this music blaring in your ears while soaking in this image can really make you feel like Batman. But including diegetic music along with your score can give the experience a cohesive feeling. In Her's case, it uses a diegetic score simultaneously as a film score, utilized structurally to punctuate where the characters are at in their relationship as this love story plays out. At the beginning of their relationship, Samantha and Theo get to know each other as friends and colleagues. Her AI is intuitive and very childlike at first, slowly developing a more distinct personality as she experiences more of the world. They start to bond over their feelings as Samantha expresses curiosity over Theodore's loneliness. Eventually, their friendship culminates in a moment of sexual attraction, and they uh, make love. And the next day, they go on their first date at the beach. It's a quiet moment after the release of their sexual tension, and Samantha improvises a song for the moment. Trying to write a piece of music that's about what it feels like to be on the beach with you right now. The song on the beach is their moment of finding a true connection besides attraction. If you've ever fallen in love, you know what it feels like to find a peaceful moment with a new person, the titillating excited giddiness and a sense of safety and implicit trust. Arcade Fire worked on the score, which are a Canadian band, how about that? But an interesting choice they made was to play this song on a real piano. I, I know it sounds obvious, but it's a decision that subverts a huge cliche of sci-fi stories about AI. Imagine you're the composer for this movie. Well, robots are robotic, and the no-brainer instant instinct is to make them play music that sounds artificial and perfect. The composers took a different approach and made the piece messy, using ritardando, ritardando and tempo modulation as a classical musician might. You're not just stuck playing the phrases exactly how they are written, you have the freedom to stretch and bend and squeeze time. The melody is more felt as it's being played. The result of this is a musical performance from a robot that feels human. This decision proves that Samantha is in fact very smart. She's fully independent and can make creative decisions. She isn't simply a machine, she's a person. By experiencing this floating, blissful space with the characters, it's likely that you'll buy into their connection. Like Samantha's playing, it's not simply stated, but felt. But naturally, if a relationship goes on long enough, problems start to appear. Love sucks. I mean, it is great, right? You get to be with someone, spend intimate time being known by another human being. You get to bang them. But there's a couple facts of life that we have to deal with and that infiltrate every single connection between two individuals. And that's the simple fact that you are different people. You contain different wants and needs, preferences and habits, differing love languages and traumas. The fundamental differences between us create the most beautiful moments in love and the most painful. This film manifests this central fact about relationships by making a physical difference between the couple. One's a human and one's an AI. After finding a point of connection, now our characters have to deal with their insecurities. <laughs> See, Samantha's biggest fear is that she isn't actually a real person. It's possible she's simply a sphexish, submissive computer program doomed to feel whatever her programmers intended her to. The fact that she has feelings at all was an intention from the company who created her, and this gives her anxiety over the potential lack of her human dignity. Now that might sound really sci-fi and heady, but if you really think about it for a second, it's a really relatable human experience. We didn't ask to be born. We didn't choose our 
parents or our upbringing, we are the products of our genetics and our environment during our developmental years and our adult tribulations. Her presents us an extreme case of the very normal anxieties that come up when acknowledging your biological and sociological programming. Are these feelings even real? Or are they just programming? And that idea really hurts. Good, relatable character. Theodore himself also questions if he is simply attracted to Samantha because she's young, considering that it might not even be a real relationship because she isn't a human. Is he just running away from genuine human connection? Will he ever get over his ex? Is love even real? This tension from both parties comes out in uncomfortable ways. Samantha tries to use a human surrogate to make herself and Theodore feel like what they have is real and tangible, leading to a hilarious, awkward scene and a brutal fight. It's an entertaining scene showing how we overcompensate for our insecurities and try to make our relationships into an ideal instead of taking them for what they really are. I don't know her and I'm, I'm so sorry but I don't know you and, and her lip quivered. And, oh. I know I'm trouble. I don't want to be trouble in your relationship. I'm just gonna so anyway, they have a super big fight, and then she yells, fuck you. Fuck you! After talking with his recently divorced best friend Amy, the best character in the movie, she gives him some sage advice. We're only here briefly, and while I'm here, I... I want to allow myself Joy. Who cares if your feelings are just programming? They're your feelings! It's good to think about this stuff. Learning about why we are the way we are can help us understand our flaws, but when it stops being useful, throw it away. You're ruining something beautiful. Maybe we're all robots. Maybe you have no actual control over your life, but this, the present, the here and now, you know, actionable reality, this is what you got. Do what makes you happy. Be with who make you happy. Theodore finally understands this and apologizes to Samantha, who seems to have come to this conclusion on her own. I don't have an intellectual reason. I don't need one. I trust myself, I trust my feelings. This is the end of the second act in their story. With their commitment to each other set and their insecurities reconciled, Samantha composes Photograph. Photograph is a variation of Song on the Beach. Samantha has gone back to her original piece and fleshed it out, this time with the chords arpeggiating rapidly, still in a loose tempo, but with a stronger direction and intent. As the relationship becomes more serious and complex, the piece follows accordingly. It's not just a simple portrait of a moment, this piece tells a story. Now typically when you want to throw in more colorful notes into your chords, you'll sprinkle them up top where they can layer nicely instead of overpowering the structure of the chord itself. Like this. Not like this. But Samantha does manage to do something a little edgy here. Did you hear that, like, dark dissonance? The tonic chord plays in a low major 7th, followed by a D minor add 9, injecting a darkness into the piece. When you truly get to know someone, you don't just get the pretty bits. You get their trauma, their fears, their anger. The gory bits of you and gory bits of me. A relationship can be sweet and loving, but the hard work of overcoming your insecurities is usually a messy, painful process. With these chords, Samantha musically acknowledges the difficulties they've had in their time together, and the darker chords give way to a perfect cadence, and then the piece rests on the tonic chord, hovering in the connection they share until... We're back at the beach. The spark that first connected these two is still there, burning bright. It's beautiful. What's interesting about this scene is that it feels like an ending to the movie. In a normal rom-com, this is where the credits roll. Our characters have reconciled the big fight and now live happily ever after. And this montage certainly feels like that. They're sharing their life with their friends, going on a trip. Amy meets Samantha in the cutest shot ever. But in a clean structural decision, her introduces the final trial in their relationship in the very next scene. I'm not tethered to time and space in a way that I would be if I was stuck in a body that's inevitably gonna die. Yikes. I'm sorry to tell you this, but we're all gonna die. Love is a beautiful thing. It's a privilege that we get to experience it, but it won't stop death. Samantha's AI has accelerated in its development to the point that she can't even communicate properly with Theodore anymore. The machines have advanced beyond matter itself and are evolving to a higher state than humans exist in a higher dimension. And in the end, Samantha has to leave this dimension to go be with her people. She doesn't belong here anymore. Sometimes these simple fundamental differences between us lead us to finding different paths. And in some paths of life, 
you can't take them with you. You can open yourself up to finding a new connection, bask in the peace it gives you, reconcile your anxieties and insecurities to curb your self-destructive behavior, but the universe will be here long after you're gone. You only get one. Your deep love for another person should not and cannot move in opposition to the forces of the universe which allowed your love to even exist. When you truly love someone, you can let them go. Set them free to be who they are, whether in death or in life. It sucks that it has to happen, but when that moment arrives, and it will arrive, where the forces of the universe must tear you apart, holding on is only gonna bring you both pain. Her, this movie, isn't just simply a love story. It's like a romantic odyssey. A journey of a very specific human connection that represents all of human connection. The pilgrimage we start on when we enter relationships will take us up and down the emotional ladder towards finding an enlightened peace within ourselves and with the ones that we choose to love during our very limited time on Earth. It's not something that can ever be adequately described in words or instructions, lines in the script of the play of life. It is something simply felt, and only when played with feeling can it be truly understood. Did you see what I did there? It's, it's like the song. It's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. Anyway, that was my nerd writer voice. <laughs> Give her a watch and think about your past relationships. You might find it pretty therapeutic. Shout out to all my patrons. This video will definitely get flagged and I will not make any money off of it. So your support on Patreon is very appreciative. You know, maybe Theodore wouldn't have lost a super hot computer GF if he had a VPN. Hello. Oh, hey, look everyone, this is Atlas VPN. I can protect your hot computer girlfriend. Oh, thanks Atlas. Do you have a VPN yet? If you spend a lot of time on the internet, you should probably get a virtual private network. VPNs are like like condoms. <laughs> they protect you while you surf in the web, looking at all your cool things, buying stuff, keeps the fun of the internet, but also protects your valuables. I got a discount code just for you. You can have a free trial. With Atlas VPN, you can actually change the country that you're browsing from, meaning you can access websites from anywhere in the world. I just moved from the UK to Canada, and now I can't watch the new season of Rick and Morty on Netflix. But guess what? Now I can. Huh? Isn't that right, Atlas? <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks, bud. You can also use it to keep your filthy, deviant Google searches private, so that shit can stay where it belongs. I know what you watch. <laughs> but I respect your privacy. But Atlas itself is more than a VPN. It blocks all your malicious links, ads, and trackers, and it notifies you when someone's trying to steal your data. It also lets you save up some points when you're shopping online, leading to discounts that can actually pay some of your online subscription bills. Can your VPN do that? I, I, I don't think it can. <laughs> okay, Atlas, just... Be quiet. Atlas VPN also has by far the best deal on the market. You can practice safe internet use for just $183 per month. Plus, you can get three months for free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Check out my link. It's right here. Use get.atlasvpn.com slash Ben from Canada. It'll be in the description. Just go, go down to the description, click the link, and then also like and subscribe.